So the next uh, talk is from my uh, nephew, uh, Stefan Pinter from the University of Connecticut, Allelic Imbalance. Um, slightly different title, but anyway, tissue specific allelic imbalance is prevalent. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk in front of this wonderful, really wonderful conference. So I'm going to talk about work that I did as a, when I was still a postdoc in Genie's lab. Um, I'm now at, at, at UConn Health. Um, and uh, just to just to orient you, so we're we're just a short drive away from uh, from Yale and Wesleyan University, and we're right next door to the Jackson Labs for genomic uh, medicine. Um, so if any of the stuff you hear today resonates with you, um, I I'd, I'd love to talk to you or or hear from you. So um, this work was done in collaboration with with David Colernori, a very very talented graduate student uh, in Genie's lab. So I'm going to talk about allelic imbalance. And um, I'm going to, I should preface this talk by saying that um, I draw these cartoons that show two nascent RNA foci in the nucleus, um, but this is a very transcription-centered uh, view, and in fact, allelic imbalance can arise at any stage, including post-transcriptionally and translationally. Um, and so, um, so keep that in mind, uh, even though the, the cartoons are very transcription-focused. Uh, so uh, allelic imbalance, uh, why does it happen? We have two copies, and that's great because we can compensate for the loss of one copy, so why would you ever not uh, take advantage of that information? Uh, in mammals, there are several classes uh, of, of allelic uh, imbalance, including imprinting, uh, which is when, when alleles are expressed according to their parental origin, and it's thought that this influences parental resource allocation. It's really a tug of war between the maternal and paternal genomes. There's also random monoallelic expression, of which X chromosome inactivation is actually really a, a subcategory because it depends on the random monoallelic expression of the exist gene, which then simply gets amplified to the rest of the chromosome. Um, and, and its feature is really that it's a stable epigenetic choice that's maintained throughout subsequent uh, cell divisions. Um, if you look at any given gene at the single cell level, you'll see that, um, at least regarding transcription, um, the, the genes are not on all the time, so you see these transcriptional bursts. And because the two alleles are not coordinated with each other, you'll often, you can find cells that either have one uh, active uh, uh, nascent transcript, two or, or none. And um, if that happens consistently, uh, because there's two variant alleles in the cell, then we're talking about really the impact of genetic variation. And so what we were interested in was a very simple experiment, was really just to understand uh, what fraction do the, can, can we systematically classify these genes um, and how many genes fall into these, these, these different fractions. Um, and, um, and if we compare from one cell type to another, do they change their, their membership? And so uh, we didn't do this in humans, which are outbreds. Uh, we, we used mice, and so we used uh, a cross of two inbred mice. Uh, so we used polymorphic um, F1 hybrids, um, which we had used previously to look at, um, to look at um, allelic imbalance in CHIP-seq studies. And so here I'm just showing you an example of two imprinted loci and the expected paternal and maternal deposition of active marks. Um, and so we like mice because they, we have access to strains that have high variant density, so we can pick strains that, are, that differ with about one variant every nucleosome. Because they were inbred um, prior to the cross, we have fully faced haplotypes. We can reproduce identical genotypes over and over again, and we can switch parental and genetic origin. And so if allelic imbalance is not caused by an epigenetic phenomenon, if it's due to genotypic variants, then one premise in, this, in these experiments is that because the two genomes are sharing a nucleoplasm, um, any, because the two sets of transacting factors can act equally on both alleles, then any difference in, in, uh, in allele, so any difference in expression between the two alleles must surely be due to uh, allelic, uh, uh, due to cis-regulatory variants. And we're gonna, we're gonna return to this premise uh, at the end of the talk. And so the experiment was very simple. We just looked at poly-A RNA. So we're looking at steady state RNA levels. Uh, we align it to two genomes to mitigate alignment bias, just like we did uh, in the previous papers. And um, we score both the significance and the magnitude of the allelic imbalance. And we score this on a scale from minus one for fully castaneous to plus one for fully mus musculus, um, or in this color chart from red all the way to blue. 
And so this, the, the, the material that we used were uh, tail tip fire blasts from, from F1 hybrids, which David um, cloned, uh, and that gave us the, the uh, opportunity to look at random monolithic expression because that's maintained uh, during, during expansion. And we had a control data set to look at uh, primary liver biopsies from that, that the Marioni group had published. And so I'm going to skip over this uh, in the interest of time, but if you do this in female animals, uh, this also has the benefit that you can uh, identify new genes that escape axon activation. And so here, here are just two examples of those. So the way, so I drew a dummy example here, but basically you have six genes there, and um, we score each gene, uh, uh, each sample individually. And then we use these, uh, these imbalance calls uh, to populate two by two contingency tables and determine whether the allelic imbalance associates with the genetic origin or the parental origin. And so um, this way we, 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 we classify the, the, these genes. And to make a long story short, we find that in the most cas cross, uh, we see that about 80% of genes are actually expressed in balanced by allelic fashion. About 20% are imbalanced and um, about a quarter of those are candidates to be really monoallelic genes because they have a more than threefold difference between the two alleles. The vast majority of the allelic imbalance was due to genotypic variation. Uh, we found about 60 imprinted genes and about 200 random, randomly imbalanced genes. I'm going to skip over this because the next slide shows the same thing. So we found um, novel imprinted genes, and what was pretty much true for this entire class uh, here I'm showing you an example of two genes sitting right next to each other, um, was that the allelic imbalance in these imprinted genes was attenuated. So you can see there is a maternal preference, but the paternal allele is still expressed um, here. And then this is what a canonical imprinted cluster looks like. This is the PEG10 cluster. And you can see that SGC and PEG10 are expressed specifically from the paternal allele. Um, but in fact, all the genes in this cluster were reported to be uh, imprinted. And so PON2, PON3 are actually imprinted in the placenta, but in tail tip fire blast, they are subject to genotypic variation and are expressed specifically or much more from the, from the, from the 129 or, or, or MUS allele. And CASD1, on the other hand, was uh, expressed in perfectly uh, balanced by allelic fashion. And so when we look at, when we compare all the known imprinted genes and the ones that we've identified, there's a pattern that emerges quite quickly. Uh, which is that the canonical, the canonical imprinted genes uh, give us that very, very strong difference uh, in expression, that strong allelic imbalance, whereas these novel genes are much more subtle. And we also noticed that we identified more, um, more imprinted genes in the tail tip fire blast that were, had a paternal, that had a paternal bias, and this was somewhat, somewhat reminiscent of a, of a recent result from the Vilena group, uh, at UNC, uh, where they had showed that actually for most genes there is a, a tiny but reproducible um, bias for paternal expression. Um, and so I should also point out though that we did not see this in the liver, so it's not clear whether that's uh, cell, uh, cell type specific, um, but they saw it across multiple tissues. So now I'm going to completely speculate here. So um, we have uh, one pair of genes was interesting because they were reported to be imbalanced, but they were actually uh, expressed in a randomly, uh, sorry, they were reported to be imprinted, but they were actually expressed in a random fashion. And what was interesting was that when one allele had a preference to be expressed from the MUS allele, the other, allele, the, the other gene would be expressed from the CAS allele and vice versa. Um, and uh, I'm labeling the speculation because we don't have enough uh, uh, samples here to really back this up, but I uh, continued with the speculation nonetheless. Um, the reason these are interesting is because they're actually sandwiching the PEG-10 cluster. And so you can see below we have uh, some 3D uh, confirmation data that um, reveals that these two genes actually sit in different topologically associated domains, but the ASB4 gene uh, uh, in yellow actually uh, reaches, oh, reaches over into the TAD of the TFPI2 gene and contacts uh, a potential cis-regulatory element um, with a similar frequency as TFPI2 itself. And so it kind of kind of uh, gives us the idea that, well, maybe, maybe these two are competing for a cis-regulatory element, maybe an enhancer that cannot work simultaneously on both of these genes at once. Um, and we have no idea whether that's true, but there is some uh, evidence out of the Global Lab recently that indeed uh, some enhancers can only work on one 
uh, gene at a time or, or on one promoter at a time. Now, this does not explain at all how that choice would be communicated to the other allele, um, but um, we'll, we'll, we're, we're trying to find similar examples in the genome. Okay, so, um, so we wanted to compare the cell type specificity, um, so whether or not a gene that has a genotypic imbalance in one direction, for example, towards the Cas allele in tail to fibroblast, whether the same is borne out in the liver. And by and large, for the most part, um, genes that were imbalanced in tail to fibroblast were not imbalanced in liver and vice versa. Um, however, the ones that were, in four out of five cases, maintained their allelic preference, and so, and so you can see this here. Um, and so we were curious as to maybe what, what made these genes that had a genotypic preference um, across both tissues, what made, them, what made them stick with their preference. And so we looked at the variant density uh, of these genes. And so this is another speculative result, really, but um, what we saw was that the genes that maintained their allelic preference um, actually had a higher variant density um, specifically over, the, over where you would expect the transcript termini to be. And so we think that maybe um, these are variants that are acting at the, at the RNA level um, and are acting on, on processing uh, of the RNA or splicing. Um, so David went ahead so we, uh, to, to validate these results by qPCR and also by FISH, and we were very lucky to have access to these wonderful oligopaint, allele-specific oligopaint uh, probes from Ting Wu's lab, um, so David could uh, do a DNA fish and label the two alleles in two different colors and combine that with an RNA fish to understand which of the two alleles was expressed. And so here you're, sh here, here you're seeing that uh, if you're looking at an imprinted gene, you see the expected uh, expression from the maternal allele uh, uh, very strongly. Spread 2 is a bi control and you see a 50-50 split. And EGFR shows a preference for the castaneous allele um, at the level of transcription that matched very nicely what we saw in the sequencing of the steady state level. And so this looked like, okay, EGFR is uh, expressed in a genotypic, uh, in a genotypic specific way uh, or, or has a genotypic preference uh, at the transcription level for the Cas allele. So if we looked, we, we were curious if we looked at the parental cells, um, that were isogenic, would we see the same preference for the Cas allele? So these are, these are inbred, these are the original inbred uh, or tail to fibroblasts from the inbred lines that had, that, that had two, that had the same alleles and so we're looking in two different, two, two different lines, a Cas line and a Mus line. And you would expect, since we've already shown that it associates with genotypic preference and I've, sh I've told you earlier that all these differences must be due to cis-acting regulation. You would expect that the EGFR gene would be, uh, would fire more frequently in, uh, in the Cas line than in the Mus line. But actually, that's not true. They're actually pretty much even. And so we came up with uh, creative models to explain this, um, but smarter people came up with a, with a much better model. Uh, so John Marioni and others proposed that actually what likely is happening is that during the divergence of, of these two lines, they were, they, there was transacting uh, variation that um, was advantageous in some, in some regulatory targets, but um, had to be compensated for in other regulatory targets. And so you have maybe, for example, a more active uh, transacting factor, and many of the cis regulatory targets now become desensitized to reduce their response to this transacting factor. But then when you put them together with a Mus allele that hasn't undergone the same transacting variation, then perhaps what's going on is that the Mus allele is more sensitive to this increased transacting component coming from the Cas. Um, so this has, there's some support for this, not just in mouse, but also uh, in yeast um, and flies, uh, as well as in Arabidopsis recently. Um, and I think um, maybe that's one of the reasons I think why, why um, you know, working with these beautiful collaborative cross uh, panels and, and, and the outbred diversity panels is, uh, is very powerful, but not, but not for the faint-hearted, as we heard yesterday. So, okay, so um, I haven't told you why any of this is important, uh, and that is, of course, understanding how our genes are allelically imbalanced uh, is important because it, it impacts uh, how phenotypes that we inherit from parents are, are penetrant. 
And so you can go through a Punnett square to, to, to figure this out. But uh, the point I want to drive home is because this changes between different cell types and different enhancer or, uh, enhancers or other regulatory elements come into play, it becomes really complicated. And so we're really uh, incredibly mosaic because of that. Okay, so with that, I want to thank you uh, and uh, thank uh, my, my old lab, um, as well as funding support, as well as my new environment, and, and thank you for travel support, and thank you for, for listening. <laughs>